Just to clarify, this is not a story from Let's Read himself. This story was submitted by a subscriber who created their own YouTube channel. I started narrating stories on YouTube because, after sending every story I wrote to all the big names and a few lesser known names, I got no response. No thanks for sending, no your story sucks, nothing. Now I won't mention who they are, but most of you should know who I'm talking about. Although one big name did read a short story of mine, which I'm very thankful for, and it wasn't my best. And this went on for a while. After months of frustration, I finally realized that it wasn't going to happen, so I decided to narrate my own stories, create a YouTube channel, pick a name and then post them myself. How hard could it be? And so I did. My stories were good, at least I thought so. And to my surprise, a few people actually liked them and, after a while, asked if I would narrate their stories. Wow, really? Okay, I thought. They would send them to me via email, which I gave them and I would narrate their stories. And that started the ball rolling. I was talking to a coworker one day about narrating stories for fun and they suggested that I check out an app called Reddit and search short scary stories and no sleep. They said they posted a few stories on there and thought that it would be perfect for me, so I did. I created an account and started my search, and there I found all kinds of amazing stories. I contacted some authors through comments and personal messages, asking permission to read their stories. Most were cool with it, and although I did get a few rejections, I just kept on asking. And always ask permission, by the way. Things were going great. I was narrating amazing stories and people were liking them and I even earned enough karma on Reddit to start my own community. I decided to use it for people to send stories to and people actually did. All the while I still searched other communities for stories to read. That was until I found that story. I should have known by their username that it wasn't a good idea. I'm not going to mention the name of it because it still sends chills up my spine just thinking about it and I'm shaking as I write this, believe it or not. It was around 1am, insomnia set in and I was sitting at my dining room table searching Reddit. When I found that story, it blew me away. It had it all, drama, suspense, emotion, everything, and I contacted the author through personal messaging asking permission, except for some reason I signed in using my real name, not my stage name. Big mistake. I realized what I did, but it was too late. I had already sent it. Anyway, mere seconds went by and I actually received a reply. Yes, I've been waiting for this, they said. Thinking they'd been waiting for someone to read one of their stories, just like I was, I replied, thank you, and planned to go on with my night. Until I received my own personal message from the author. Hi, my name's Susan, want to talk? I figured... What the hell? I'm not doing anything else. What could it hurt? So I sent back, sure. After about a 30 minute conversation, I found out that one, the author was female. Two, we both like Stephen King. Three, we both like horror movies. And four, we both lived in the United States, only a few states away from each other. I started getting tired and I let her know and we ended the conversation, both saying goodnight. I was lying in bed, almost asleep when... I got a message from her saying, I'm glad to have someone like you to talk to. I missed that. I shrugged it off and went to sleep. A couple of days went by and I came home from work and found a note on my door. It said, Hi, sorry I missed you. Love, Susan. What? Love? I only talked to her for like half an hour. How'd she get my address? What did I just get myself into? I took the note off the door and quickly went inside, locking the door and calling the police. I told them the story, and they said that there was nothing they could do until an actual crime was committed. Wow, very reassuring. I hung up from them and tried to do my normal routine. Make coffee, get changed, drink coffee, and so on and so forth. I couldn't get that note out of my head. The doorbell rang. I froze and slowly walked to the window to see who it was. It was a woman. She was about five and a half feet tall, tattered, dirty clothes, long, stringy brown hair. It looked like she hadn't bathed in a month. And I immediately knew it was Susan. 
I had to end this quick, right now, before it turned ugly, and ugly it turned. I opened the door and said, look Susan, I don't know what you think's going on, but I just wanted to read your story, that's it. I'm sorry if you thought there was something more, but there's not, just, just go home. I shut the door and walked back into the house. She screamed like a wild woman. She started pounding on the door, screaming, I love you, I love you. I immediately ran to the phone to call 911. A rock or brick or something came crashing through the front window. I turned and saw that crazy woman climbing into my house, screaming, read my story, read my story. The shards of glass from the broken window cutting her as she climbed in, blood on the window and the floor. The dispatcher said, 911, what's your emergency? And I barely had time to say anything before she charged, slamming into me, knocking me over the desk and falling to the floor herself. She was kicking and screaming like a lunatic. I got up, phone still in hand, and smashed it hard against her temple as she was getting up. See, I don't hit women, but this woman deserved it. Her eyes rolled into the back of her head and the screaming stopped and she fell to the floor unconscious. I heard sirens outside. I guess the 911 operator heard it all. The cops came, took my statement, and they made me stay outside while the paramedics tended to Susan, if that even was her real name. The cops put her in cuffs and the paramedics took her to the ambulance. On her way out, she looked at me, laughing. And they put her inside and left. The cops finished up and did the same. I was left with a messed up door, a broken window, blood all over the place, a broken desk and a broken phone. All over one story. And I was done. I moved out that night. I left all my stuff behind. I slept in my car till payday then rented a room off a co-worker. And I never narrated another story again. So, if any of my subscribers are reading this and wondered whatever happened to me, now you know. This is why I stopped narrating stories on YouTube. I'm a tall yet extremely skinny guy and I'm 21 years old. I was 20 years old at the time, and it was the week before the presidential election in the United States. I felt a lot of anxiety about all of this as I live in Manhattan, and there are a lot of crazy people in that city who act as if though the entire world was going to end over one simple thing. So feeling exhausted from both that and my university, I decided to visit my friends in Moscow. You see, I'm half Russian and I have an apartment in the city center of Moscow. I had never been in Russia while it snowed, and luckily during this time it was snowing. The city looked beautiful and the vibe I had from the city was perfect. I felt so calm, safe, and the whole world around me just seemed quiet. Unfortunately, I had severe jet lag and fell asleep at around 5pm Moscow time that day. My friend went home to get ready for her classes the next day and I woke up at around 3am, and I could not fall back asleep. So, I decided to go outside and take a walk around my area while it calmly snowed. I walked around the dead, empty city in my district and took in all of the beautiful architecture and snow falling down heavily. I don't remember how long I was walking, but I crossed a bridge and entered deeply into a neighborhood that I was not very familiar with. I thought it would be okay, as I was in my district and sort of remembered the way back home. I eventually came up to this ginormous entrance of a block unit with a beautiful gate on it. The gate was open so I decided to step inside. It looked like a small little compound or something similar to it. If anyone is from Russia, they probably know what I'm talking about. Everything was dead quiet and the trees canopied in the square complex. To the right was an extremely tall building with a huge door. I peeked inside and saw a lightly dimmed lobby, typical Russian lobby vibe with a blinking fluorescent light. I held on the door and, to my surprise, it was unlocked. I entered into the massive building and looked around and I saw many stairs wrapping around in a square leading up, a small typical Russian elevator and to the right of the stairwell stairs that led down. The door at the bottom of the stairs was open. 
I absolutely do not know what came over me as I'm not one to adventure alone, but as I stated earlier, everything just felt so beautiful. The quiet vibe of snow-covered Russia had me feeling so peaceful and I decided to just tiptoe on down to the basement to take a closer look. I walked into the room with the open door and threw on my flashlight on my phone. I saw an extremely long tunnel and I couldn't see the end of it. I felt threatened by it and got extremely uncomfortable and I decided it was probably best for me to leave. When I turned around, the only light that was entering the tunnel was from outside the doorway. I saw standing in the door a black silhouette. I quickly understood it was the outline of a person who was at least five inches taller than me, so I would say that they were probably six foot five. He was massive, and my stomach dropped so hard with my heart beginning to beat super quickly. He started to speak to me in Russian, but as my Russian isn't fluent, I didn't understand everything he said. I'm sorry, I don't speak Russian. I said to him in some broken Russian, and he says back, You speak English? And he said that to me in English, and I told him I did, and he asked me if I knew where I was. No, I told him, as my mind started to fill up with a lot of different scenarios, one of which with me having to run down this tunnel and getting lost to avoid him if he decides to chase me. These tunnels used to be for Red Army soldiers to move from one place to another during the war, he explained to me. This whole building used to be a bunker for Red Army soldiers. I said, ah, to show some interest, and began to move towards the left while facing him in attempts to get him to move out of the doorway. This whole place is now apartments. I have one on the top floor. You should come see it, he said to me. Ah, it's quite late, and I think I should be going, I said. However, he grabbed my small wrist with a lot of strength and led me towards the stairs to go to the main floor of the lobby. I have a view that you'll love. He called the small elevator, and if any of you have ever been to Russia, you know exactly what type of elevator it is, the type that can barely fit two people. He began telling me about how he just got back from Chicago and that his husband loved Chicago as well, and this started to have me panicking as I thought to myself that there would be another man up to where he was bringing me and I would have two people overpowering me. Once we get to his room, I look at this massive studio apartment that he had. He had only candles to light the room with a lot of tapestries dividing it up, with both the candle and moonlight shining through it to create a super eerie vibe. I looked out his window as he instructed me, and I have to admit, the view was amazing. I got a panoramic view of the city, and then I started scoping around looking for an opportunity to get out of there. Where's your husband? I asked, and he looked at me and laughed. Oh, he's dead. He then picked me up, and I asked him what he was doing. He brought me into another room and began to touch me inappropriately. He ran his hand down my back and took my phone from my back pocket. I didn't realize that he did this as I was just in horror as this man licked me and said explicit things in Russian. I tried to pull away, but it made him squeeze and corner me even harder. After about ten minutes of this, he told me to wait a moment. He went into his bathroom, and in this moment I immediately sprinted over to the door. There were no lights, so I went to pull out my phone for a flashlight, only to my horror, the phone was missing from my back pocket. I almost nearly had a heart attack as I realized that I would have to go back into that bedroom to get my phone. I darted back into the room and saw my phone lying on a couch that he had next to his bed. I grabbed it and made a run for the door. I unlocked two locks on one door and when I opened that one, there was an outer door and I managed to get it open. As I ran out, the adrenaline was so high in me and I ignored the elevator and went straight for the stairs. I ran around in circles down it for what seemed like forever until I finally reached the bottom. I practically leaped down a few steps to get out of the lobby into the main door that I had entered from. It wouldn't open as I pushed as hard as I could on it, and I then began to start sobbing to myself and cursing. The thoughts of me having to go back into that tunnel to hide again from him came over me and I almost began to accept that as a reality at this point. I quickly tried to pull myself together and noticed the typical button you should press to disable the magnet that holds the doors locked. I pressed it, 
heard the monotone beep that follows and fell out of the door and into the snow. I never understood why characters could not pull themselves together when running in horror movies, always falling on themselves. But in that moment, I did the same and I sort of understood it now. I treaded through the thigh-high snow into the main road by exiting the complex. I sprinted, ignoring my lungs screaming for air down the main road, only slowing down once I reached a bridge that led me to my street. Once I got inside, I sat in my bed for two hours, nearly shaking, before I even bothered to tell anyone else about it. This story is not about a ghost or an encounter with a creepy stranger. It's not even about a near-death experience or something like that. As a matter of fact, I was never in any danger during the event I'm about to tell you. Nonetheless, it's a disturbing memory that I will carry with me until the day I die. I grew up in a small city, the kind of place that you could barely call a town if it wasn't for the sheer number of people living there. Downtown was only a couple of blocks long and in the middle of it was one of the biggest buildings in the area. It was the local movie theater, named after the city. I remember going there when I was very young, about seven years old, and watching the first Pokemon movie. It was probably nothing compared to the theaters that we have nowadays, but back then it was huge for me and I loved it. So when a few years later I heard the cinema was going out of business, I felt really sad about it. The building was sold to a religious group that used it for their services. You know the type. Loud music, big crowds with their arms in the air singing prayers, some having seizures on the stage while the pastor yells through a mic. Every time I walked past the old cinema, I would see the announcements of the congregation where the movie posters would have been, and if they were in session, you could hear them singing from the other side of the street. This group owned the cinema for nearly a decade, until the local government brought back the building in order to restore it as a historic landmark of the city. When this happened, I was studying construction with the intent to follow architecture or civil engineering at college, and my class was very lucky to be involved with the cinema's restoration project because two of our teachers were architects working on it. I will always remember the day that we went to visit the old cinema. Our class was small, only a handful of students, but we were all around the same age, so we all shared childhood memories of when the cinema was operational. We ran through the corridors of the auditorium, sat in the chairs just like we did when we were little kids, and began stomping on the wooden floor with our feet, filling the entire room with the echoes of our drumming and our laughter, a little ritual of sorts everyone used to do right before the beginning of the movie. Once nostalgia time was over, we went back to the purpose of the trip and began to survey the building. We were very excited because there was a unique opportunity to go into the places that we would have never been allowed to otherwise, so we made sure to check every last corner, every single room, no matter how far and no matter how obscure. The first one that we found was below the stage. On one of the corners there was a little door, not very visible, probably because it was meant for maintenance staff only. Behind it we found a long room filled with rusty boilers and part of the old heating system that was no longer in use. The place was a little creepy, with all those old tanks and pipes crowding the narrow space, but what we found past them was what really started to freak us out. This room was small, very small. It was, after all, basically just leftover space behind the boilers, yet it contrasted so much with the rest of the area around it, it may as well have been from a different place altogether. The walls were painted a light color, white I think, but I don't remember it very well because what really got my attention were the drawings inside them. There were rainbows, a smiling sun, trees and flowers, and happy little people with smiles on their faces, with dotted eyes. It was very clearly a daycare. The whole class and teacher gathered to see the discovery, and we were all very confused about the strange placing of this room. Okay, we could understand the need for a place to keep the kids that were too little to be amongst the crowd during prayers, or maybe the ones of the people who work there, but... The place was just odd. The stage was probably one of the loudest places in the auditorium during the services, and this was right below it, so there was no way that it could be a quiet place for the children. We left the boiler room and continued our tour through the theater, a little puzzled about our finding, but not giving it too much thought. 
Outside of the auditorium, there were the bathrooms, both in terrible condition, the ticket sales booth, and a huge set of stairs that led to a mezzanine in the auditorium. Half of the seats that were totally ruined due to a water leak in the roof, and I cursed these people for not taking proper care of the building. With that part done, all that was left was the projection room on the third floor. Behind the tickets booth, there was a door that led to a spiral stair. I don't remember how tall it actually was, but it must have been over 10 meters of metallic steps without a single resting spot. I wasn't exactly an athlete, but I could walk several kilometers with no problem and rode on a bike to and from school every single day. Yet by the time I reached the top of the stairs, I was exhausted. And I wasn't the only one. All of my classmates complained about how hard it was to walk up there. After a short break to catch our breath, we moved on to explore the third floor. It was roughly a narrow passageway with a couple of divisions to form different rooms, but it was more than enough for what it was made for. The first room from the stairs was a storage deposit, probably where they kept the movies and other equipment, and except for some trash, it was mostly empty. The second room was the one that we were all excited to see, the projector room. The old machine was so big that it was still there, and there were even some pieces scattered around. It was quite a piece of history, and we were all very thrilled to check it out, so no one really bothered to move on to the very last room until we were about to leave. And there, we saw it again. There was a train in this one instead of a rainbow. Something was written on it in big colorful letters. Something about Christ, I can't remember it well. The drawings were a bit old and the paint slightly peeled from the walls, but the colors were just as cheerful as you would expect for a place where children play. My heart sank to my stomach as I came to the realization of what that place really was, the one behind the boilers probably serving the same purpose. I took notice of how isolated that room was, literally the furthest away you could possibly get from everyone else. I thought about the three floors of stairs and imagined what it would be like to have a child walk all the way up, only to end up in that room, the room with the colorful train in the wall. My classmates and I exchanged horrified expressions as I knew that they were thinking the same thing. We never visited the theater again, even though we continued with the restoration project for several months and we never talked about those two rooms. Cases of exploitation of children in the church are well known by everyone, to the point that a predatory priest is practically a cliché. But this is the kind of thing that you think happens in some place far away, in another city, even in another country. You never imagine it can happen in the very town you live in, the place where you grew up, in the very same building where you once watched a Pokemon movie when you were seven years old. For most of my childhood, my family and I lived one house away from a child predator, and for the sake of the story I'll just call him Mr. Stan. Our old neighborhood started at the top of a hill and went down to a small lake where the road turned right and branched off into a cul-de-sac and another residential road. Mr. Stan's house was at the top of the hill and ours was in the middle. Mr. Stan lived in the neighborhood long before we moved in. It's hard for me to remember any vivid details about him as I was very young at the time, but what I do remember is that every time he saw us, his face would scrunch up as if he smelled something terrible. There was one house between his place and ours and something that I'm very grateful for. I don't know what life would have been like if we had him living right next to us. Right from when we were little, my parents were very strict about walking past Mr. Stant's house. They told us that Mr. Stan was sick in the head, and if he ever asked us to come into his home, we were never, ever allowed to do so by ourselves. For years, no one told us exactly why Mr. Stan was bad, but we didn't need details, we just knew to avoid him. The look he gave us whenever he was working on his car or planting flowers in his garden was enough. When my sister and I would walk up the hill to school, we would cross the street when we got to his place, just to be safe. Like I said, I don't remember very much about Mr. Stan, and his twisted story begins long before I was even born. For this, I turned to my mom to fill in the details. Mom said that before we'd ever moved into the cul-de-sac around the late 70s and early 80s, Mr. Stan had already had the reputation of being a heavy drinker. 
He would get drunk and go over to the house of the family right across the street from us to do terrible things to the daughter while she was babysitting. The daughter tried to tell her mother about it, but since she was a rebellious child, her mother didn't believe her. Her family and Mr. Stan's family were actually good friends. Mr. Stan worked as a corrections officer, and soon accusations surfaced that Mr. Stan and another officer regularly touched their co-workers' kids. Mr. Stan was able to avoid conviction by ratting out the other officer, but in the process, he lost his job. As far as I know, he never really worked after that. Mr. Stan had two daughters of his own, and while the older one claimed that she was predatorized and suffered from mental problems as a result, the younger one said that she was never mistreated in any way and grew up to be a very positive person. Mr. Stan's wife stood by her husband and claimed that he was innocent throughout the whole ordeal. Ironically, the older daughter's emotional instability resulted in her children going to live with Grandpa. More on that in a moment. When my family moved into our house in the cul-de-sac, our next-door neighbor, a kind but nosy old man, told my dad to keep my sister and I away from Mr. Stan. He told my parents the gossip and Mr. Stan's history with children, which understandably horrified them both. As a result, my mom and dad were wary of him from the start. Mr. Stan was cordial enough. He would wave hello to my family and all that neighborly stuff. According to mom, he even offered to babysit my little sister and I, to which my parents politely but emphatically declined. Then, sometime around 2002, my dad was going to work when he came across a neighborhood kid, Lana, on her way up the street. My dad's a chatty person, and so he asked Lana what she was up to. Lana told him that she was going to Mr. Stan's house to give him a back rub, quote-unquote. Dad knew that something was off, so he told Lana's parents. And to his surprise, they weren't alarmed at all and said that that sort of thing happened all the time. According to Mum, when Lana was older, Dad asked her if Mr. Stan ever acted inappropriately toward her during those visits, and her answer was definitely... When my sister was in kindergarten and I was in grade 3, Mr. Stan's grandkids came to live with him and his wife for reasons I mentioned earlier. My parents couldn't believe that this was allowed by anyone, especially considering the allegations and neighborhood gossip around Mr. Stan. His granddaughter was in the same kindergarten class as my sister and his grandson was about my age. Mum told me that it was so disturbing to see the sweet little granddaughter at school every day and know what was probably going on behind closed doors. My parents have always had strong morals, particularly my dad. They would often talk about what they should do. They wanted to report Mr. Stan to the authorities before any harm could come to his grandchildren. Mom and dad knew that if they reported Mr. Stan, they would be putting themselves at risk, and the rest of the neighborhood was no help. Mom said it was as if they were all hiding under rocks and turning a blind eye to what was happening. In the end, my parents' strong morality won out and they decided, with the risk of being exposed as whistleblowers, to report Mr. Stan to the principal at my elementary school. The principal, in turn, called the ministry who sent people to Mr. Stan's house for home visits and investigations, as they put it. In the end, it was decided that the grandchildren would be removed from Mr. Stan's home. Mom isn't sure how it happened, but somehow it was leaked that my parents were the ones who reported Mr. Stan as being who he was, and she thinks Lana's family may have had a hand in it. And, as Mum put it, that's when the real fun began. Mr. Stan was no longer friendly toward my family, no more waves, no more chit-chat. Instead, he would target my mum with his car if she was walking down the road alone or scream obscenities at my dad as he went to work. A few times he crossed the center line to scare us if we passed each other while driving. He told my dad that he ruined his life and that he was a horrible person. Thinking about that now really boils my blood because my dad is one of the kindest and most considerate men I know. Mum was miserable and wanted to move, but dad, as unshakable as he is, said he wasn't in a hurry. Mum told me it took three years of house hunting before she finally convinced dad that it was time to go. Only after all of this, when we had been living in our beautiful new home out in the country, did I finally start to uncover the details of the story, but sadly it doesn't end there. After we moved out of the cul-de-sac, Lana and other girls who were now grown up came forward to report Mr. Stan and what he had done. 
he was hauled into court for a second time, and this time there was no one that he could rat on to save himself. The testimony against him was building up. My parents followed the trial in the newspaper. They wanted to see him put away for all of the terrible things he'd done. I have no memory of these proceedings, of course, and nobody wanted to explain it to me. I don't blame them. Mr. Stan was not only a former corrections officer, but now he was also convicted. He knew that he would not last long if he went to prison. So, on a quiet morning one week before his sentencing, Mr. Stan took a hunting rifle and shot himself. The folks who moved into Lana's house after her family left were walking their kids to school when they heard the shot. Mum tells me the image of that scene still haunts her to this day. I think she imagines what it would have been like if it were her walking my sister and I to school in place of that other family, or maybe she was disturbed to learn that Mr. Stan had a gun. I know it sounds harsh, but I'm glad he's gone. He can never hurt another child again. My memories of this whole ordeal are far less interesting than the actual event, but one thing I do remember very clearly is being afraid of Mr. Stan's house. I knew it was dangerous. In my memory, it was painted black with white stucco. The car park and stairs to the front door were all underneath the wood roof, which cast the entire front of the house into shadow. To me, it was a monster house, though I didn't know why. My sister and I only ever went to Mr. Stan's front door once. It was Halloween and my parents decided it was okay for us to trick-or-treat at his house, since they would be standing at the bottom of the stairs. I was actually very reluctant to go and my parents had to encourage me that it was okay. Mr. Stan's house was the only one that didn't need Halloween decorations to be scary. So my sister and I cautiously climbed the stairs and rang the doorbell. Mr. Stan's wife opened the door. She was kind to us and gave us candy and I remember being surprised that Mr. Stan's wife was so nice. But what I remember most was that I wanted to see inside the forbidden home. For some reason this has still stuck with me. I looked behind Mrs. Stan and there was Mr. Stan in a wife beater, top, beer belly and all, sitting in an armchair watching TV. It was dim in the living room except for a lamp and the glow of the TV, and Mr. Stan didn't look at us. For years I wonder if that was what bad men look like. When I think about this story now, 11 years later, it really hits me how dark my neighborhood was under the surface. It's quite disturbing to me because my childhood was actually quite happy. I was too young to notice anything wrong and I couldn't sense the tension that my parents lived with every day. I didn't know how much potential danger my sister and I were in. All I knew was that it was a beautiful day to play with my marbles and go to the lake. But now that I think of it, Mr. Stan may have been the reason that my parents bought a copy of You Can Say No, a picture book that teaches children about safety around bad people. I think my parents handled the situation very well and I'm so thankful that they were attentive and brave during the whole thing. The story could have gone very differently. And when I think about our house on the old cul-de-sac, it's usually the happy memories I think of first. Mum tells me that despite all the trouble they went through, neither she or dad regret the decisions they made. And she left me with one last ominous message. They say that every neighborhood has a predator living there. Most of the time, we just don't know it. This is a true story that happened during an evening winter walk on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. This happened several years back when I was 13, and this was a time when I was growing up in New York. We actually had a summer house on Cape Cod and spent every other weekend there, if we could. Cape Cod is a peninsula off the east coast of Massachusetts, so it becomes very busy, even crowded during summertime. But during the winter season it becomes empty. The majority of the houses in our area are owned as summer houses, so during winter the houses are still there, but the people are not. In contrast to New York, there are only street lamps on the single main road in this town, and the main road goes from the town center to the beach. Aside from this road, all the others are dark and very black at night. Also, Cape Cod extends out into the Atlantic from the mainland, forming a bay, Cape Cod Bay. Not only can one watch the sunrise over the Atlantic Ocean, but can watch the sunset over Cape Cod Bay on any given clear day. 
Another effect of being surrounded by ocean is that there are very little man-made light at night. The stars are so clear that the Milky Way is clearly visible spanning across the sky on clear nights. This story happened during the vacation period between Christmas and the New Year. The Christmas celebration was finished, there was plenty of leftover turkey and pumpkin pie, and we got a bit of cabin fever with all the Christmas food and family on one evening. My older sister, who's seven years older than I, 20 at the time, came up with an idea to take a walk to the harbor, which is about a 20 minute walk from our house. The harbor can be fun because we can walk on the docks and walk among the boats. While I was a bit creeped out to walk around a deserted beach town on a cold winter night, I also thought that it would be fun to get out of the house and maybe even be exciting. We headed out, across the street from our classic Cape Cod cottage. It's a field with a forest at the other end. At night time, I would also have a little fear that there might be some psycho watching from the tall grass. Perhaps he would have an axe. But while I kept my nerves wary, I knew it was my imagination. But still, icy wind blowing on tall grass is a perfect setting for some horror movies. Add to this a moonless sky with a million sparkling stars in the Milky Way above, and the horror setting is at Stephen King level. We walked out to the main road, went a bit down the road, and then turned to walk down a side street that leads to the street that dips downhill toward the harbor. This side street runs along the back side of a long hotel. It's more like a two-level motel painted yellow that has a pool. It's well situated in town, so it can be full of life during the summer. On this December evening, the hotel was closed for the season, completely dark and several windows were covered with plywood for protection. My sister mentioned that a hotel that spans an entire block but is partially boarded reminds her of a horror movie, like one of those slasher films where the characters make all the wrong decisions and walk into the worst of dark places, only to find their worst nightmare come true. At the end of the street with the hotel, we continue to the left, which is a long road downhill through the woods to the harbor. This isn't a pure forest because there are houses set back from the road with an occasional driveway. Many of the driveways have reflectors on a rock, a fence, or just standing on a metal stick. These reflectors reflect back the headlights from cars. I mention this because we couldn't see any of them or anything. It was pitch black in the wooded area and the road seemed to continue into the darkness. And come to think of it, we hadn't seen a single car, or a single person, or any sort of life since we left our house, and my nerves were on edge. I was only 13 at the time, and although my nerves were screaming, I tried to stay calm because I wanted to seem tough to my sister. The woods alongside the road were particularly nerve-wracking. The trees came right up to the asphalt on each side of the road, providing many opportunities to hide someone or something. The houses beyond the woods were dark because vacationers rarely came here in the winter as I said and I started to notice that my sister was also starting to lose her nerves and that's when I felt it. I felt a flush of energy move up the back of my neck, making it feel like the hairs were standing on end. This is a feeling that I get when I feel like I'm being watched. It's hard to describe this feeling but I still experience it today, sometimes when someone is looking at me from behind. It's either some kind of sixth sense, or it's just my imagination working with some intuition. We were now midway into the wooded area, down the hill towards the harbor. I was starting to lose my composure and was just about to stop pretending not to be freaking out and tell my sister let's go back, when she suggested it. And she says, It's late, maybe we don't have to go all the way to the harbor. And I replied, Yeah, plus it's kind of creepy and dark down there. The back of my neck was shivering and I felt my body shudder as it wrestled between acting relaxed and flipping the switch to fight or flight mode. My sister then says, Yeah, very creepy. Come on, let's go back to the house. We can see the harbor tomorrow. We turned around and she grabbed my hand and we started walking quickly back up the hill. I remember that she held my hand so tight that it actually hurt. My sister never holds my hand and I can't think of another time that she's done this. And this is where the story takes a deep dive down the rabbit hole. As we got towards the end of the wooded area, my sister screams out, I've got a knife and I'm not afraid to use it. She didn't lose any of the rhythm in her fast walk while saying this. We crossed a street now and headed onto the street with the back side of the closed two level motel. My sister continued speed walking and looked back. She let out a little panicked noise and looked back again, 
and then she commanded me, don't look back. I was utterly freaking out at this point. Aside from the eerie vibe of the dark, empty street and my own inner panic, I had not actually seen anything out of the ordinary, with the exception of my sister's completely insane behavior. And then she says, When I say run, you run, okay? Okay. We were almost on the main road, a block from our street, and she screams, Run! And we booked it. She let go of my hand and we both broke into the fastest sprint we could manage. I could hear our footsteps banging on the asphalt and I could also hear several other steps banging behind us in the distance. We cut around the grassy area to take a shortcut toward our street and ran through the front yards of our neighbor's house to make a beeline for the front door of our home. And we made it. We both ran in and locked the storm door which is mostly glass. I was panicking, but I wasn't sure if there was anything or if we were just going crazy. It was a strange transition from outside, which was terrifying, to the inside, a warm, lit house which felt safe. I was questioning what had happened in my mind, and I could sense that my sister was also questioning herself whether there was even a threat, or if we both had just lost our minds collectively. I asked my sister what she saw, and she said that there was a man standing at the edge of one of the driveways. We had walked right by him on the way back, and she said that when we were behind the hotel, he crossed the street and was seemingly following us. She said he was looking right at us, and although we were walking very fast, he seemed to be gaining on us. She explained that it didn't make sense that a man would be standing out there in that dark wooded area. Honestly, I don't understand really what happened that night, and I'm not sure how much of what my sister said was true, or if she was just seeing things or not. But one thing is for sure, I realize that I prefer walking to that harbor during daylight. This story happened when I was 12 years old. I'm a female and 25 and the story I'm about to tell you it might not be as scary as most but for me and my parents it was. I remember it was a Saturday night at around 9 or 10 p.m. during the summertime. I owned one dog at the time, his name is Benny. My parents decided that night that they feel like going for a walk around the block, walking Benny and asked me whether I wanted to join them. I said no because I wanted to play PWI on my PC, Perfect World International, and my parents were okay with leaving me alone since the walk wouldn't take longer than 30 minutes tops. As my parents would get dressed to leave the house, I logged into PWI and looked around in my guild and global chat to see if anyone was on. For some reason, no one was, so I decided to join my parents. I get dressed, put Benny on his leash, and we all leave. I'd like to mention that I lived in an apartment building that had 10 floors and we lived on the very first floor. Not sure how to explain, but you have the basement of the building and then the first row of apartments. Basically, you enter the building and you're already facing the apartments. I lived in the very first one and I remember always hating that because whoever would pass by our door, we would hear them at any time of the day or night. Whoever was lurking at night, we would hear them and it was somewhat eerie to live on floor zero. Anyway, we leave the house, my dad closes the door and we had three keyholes and a steel bar that would block the door from the inside. The bar covered half of the door. Precautions were my father's obsession and we exit the building and enjoy our walk. After 15 minutes we realize that the wind has changed from warm summer wind to an incoming storm. My mom makes the call to go back home as Benny already did all of his duties so we all return. We open the building door, climb the five stairs to our door and attempt to open it, and my father does the following, unlocks the first three locks, and then attempts to unlock the metal bar that holds the door locked. At that moment my father pauses turns around at us with the most serious face I'd ever seen on him and whispers us to call the police and ring the neighbor's door. My mom goes to the second apartment and the neighbor, Ted, comes out asking my father what had happened. My dad whispered to him covering the see-through hole of the door. Someone's in their house. He or they are holding the door. Please stay here with my family and I'll attempt to open it, but I'll be back. After saying that, I see my father rush all by himself around the building in the dark. I say dark because we didn't have a street light on the side of our apartment facing the block garden. 
My dad disappears into the darkness. I go outside too, not following him too much, but only to hear if he's in trouble. He's my dad, don't judge me. As soon as I get out, I hear him shout, Hey, you, come back. Who the hell do you think you are? I'm calling the police. At the same time I hear him shout, I look at Ted, who manages to open the door and enter the house. I go after them and enter my home. It no longer felt like my house, though. In just 15 minutes while we were walking, the home invaders made a complete mess of our home. All of our shelves and wardrobes were pulled out and our clothes scattered all over the house. Benny's dry food was all over the floor, indicating that they must have tripped in his bowls, probably not knowing that we owned a dog. But what scared me the most was how organized they were. I say they because after seeing the disaster that was left behind, we knew it was impossible for just one person to hold the door, steal, and organize what they want to take with them. I say organize because the thieves put in our living room, all packed and ready, what they wanted but couldn't steal. On the couch they placed our laptops, one of our TVs, my father's collection of coins, our phones, chargers, wallets, and even my father's camera. He's a photographer and that week he had to attend a wedding. They didn't have enough time to steal all of that so they just settled with some of my mom's jewelry and some pocket money. After seeing this, in my silly child mind I rushed to my room to check my piggy bank. I always saved up money from whatever chores that I did. It wasn't much, but it was my work and savings at that time, and I thought that they stole it too. When I enter my room, I see the metal bars covering my windows are cut open and my window broken. This is how they entered. Through my room. My room is the only room facing the side of the building and the one most secluded from views. Needless to say that I never felt safe in my own room in which I had to live for the next 10 years of my life until I moved in with my fiancé. The police arrive, they start throwing white dust, I have no idea what it is still, all over our house to find fingerprints I guess, and they take pictures, take our statements, analyze my room and window, and they were unable to catch the home invaders but were able to tell us that this invasion was not the only one in our neighborhood. And during that month, another four houses were broken into, one of them being the home of a cop, not related with the cops at our home. They told us that the invaders analyzed their victims, learned their schedule, even knew where the children's rooms were as they seemed to be entering the house through the children's windows. All the families affected by them had children. They did not expect us to be back that soon and panicked. Hence, one of them was holding the door with his body so that the others could flee. The person after which my dad was shouting was probably the one holding the door and escaping last through my broken window. I don't know what could have happened if I didn't change my mind and give up on raiding for gears and PWI. I would probably have come face to face with these invaders. I'm happy I didn't, and I hope to God that I never have to meet with them, period. I will admit first off that I have heard a lot of these deep web and dark web stories and have always called BS. However, a close friend of mine swore that she had been to this place and that she had seen some really messed up things. Some she would talk about and others she refused. She said some of the things that she had seen would haunt her for the rest of her life. I should just let it go at that but I wanted to believe that she was making it all up and that there was no such place. but. I was the one that was wrong. You know the drill by now. I downloaded Tor, Onion, and found the hidden wiki. I had been warned about some of the links and how they can trick you into some really crazy and horrible things. I clicked a few, and they were mostly meetups or escort requests, drug deals, things like that. And needless to say, I was really starting to think that I was right and that the deep web was just an easy way to make shady deals that couldn't be traced. It's lame, tame, and a little boring. I looked around for something remotely interesting until I found the link, The Night Watchman. Okay, this could be interesting. I was thinking that it might be some guy telling creepy stories or walking around a sleepy town at night or something. What greeted me was a flat, black page with three videos blown up to cover the space sitting side by side in a line. They were paused and on each of them was a picture of different people. The first one had a family of four, mom, dad, and two little girls. 
The second was a couple with the female being obviously pregnant. The third was just one woman and her dog, a cute black lab with a white streak over his left eye. Before I could study them for too long, a voice came through. It was male, but slightly distorted, so I couldn't really hear what he actually sounded like. But here's what it said. Good evening. Tonight the night watchmen have brought you three unique households. Each of them live different lives, believe different things, have different future plans. He stopped here and cleared his throat. And for this next part, it sounded like he was smiling. Watch each video and then choose one. I really didn't understand the point of this task, but honestly, my interest was piqued. I was curious where this was going. I clicked the first video. There wasn't much to it. It showed the family in their home, skipping through moments of them watching TV, playing in the backyard, having supper, the parents putting the kids to bed and then retiring to their own bed to make love. It cut off there, thank God. I was starting to feel like a weird creep. I was seeing a part of people's lives that were meant for only them. I reluctantly clicked the next video, and I was transported into the home of a young couple getting ready to start a family. It skipped through them in the baby's room hugging and generally looking excited. They ate salads at the kitchen table, went through mail, looked through baby books and magazines, watched a show on TV and then went to bed, snuggling up together. This one was so sweet that I couldn't help but smile at what I'd seen. However, I was still a voyeur in their little personal moments. I had gone through the others. I figured it was only right to watch the last one. This one was of a single woman living with just her dog. She was a bit of a slob. She had dishes piled up, laundry on a love seat in the living room, and trash that was overflowing. The other two had been pretty tidy, the family having some toys and laundry lying around, the couple with a very clean house. I wondered if there was a point to that since it did show these aspects in the videos. Anyway, the woman seemed lonely. She watched a lot of TV, ate a half gallon of ice cream, checked her cell phone every few moments, obviously hoping for a call or text, played fetch with her dog, fed him and then went to bed, taking her phone with her. She began to pleasure herself and I began to feel incredibly awkward. Thankfully this one ended there as well. I waited to see what was next. The videos reset and went back to the stills of each one again. The voice came back over and said, Now that you have seen, which will you choose? I sat there and watched, praying that someone else was here watching this too and would choose, but nothing happened for a few minutes. The videos disappeared and another three videos began playing simultaneously, and these turned my stomach. There were three tall men, I assumed that they were men by what character I could catch. They each wore the same clothing, a black shirt, pants, boots, and long black trench coat that dangled around their ankles. To top it all, they each wore a large wide brim black hat. Have you decided? Which one will you choose? The voice chimed in over the obviously live feed. Death comes on swift wings for our ill-fated friends. You must choose one. That's how the game goes. He thought this was a game, and I was horrified. Was I really supposed to choose who died here and who survived? It was ridiculous, and I went to close the page. Calmly, the voice began again. Before you close us down, you should know that if you do not choose one of the three shown here, your family will be next. I was startled by his declaration, but figured that he was just trying to scare me. He was doing a very good job, truthfully. Anna, he said, and my heart skipped a beat. He said my name, and now I was officially terrified, and I just wanted this to stop. Anna, dear sweet Anna, I know it's a difficult choice, but it must be made. Please, if you will, direct the night watchmen to their chore. The original videos came back up, and I knew that it meant that it was time for me to pick someone to die. Maybe it's just a horrible joke that some hacker and his friends like that play on unsuspecting deep web surfers, I stated out loud. It was more to make me feel better than anything, even though my heart was still pounding. I looked at the people again. There was a family there, children. I couldn't choose them. Then there was the expectant couple. I couldn't do this, it was too much. 
Choose. The normally calm voice barked at me. Choose now. I jumped and looked at the last one. It was the lonely woman with a dog for a companion. She had the least to lose and she was alone without kids or a husband. It wasn't okay, but I quickly clicked her video. Very well. So shall it be. The voice was calm and smooth once again. The videos of the Night Watchman came back up. Night Watchman, a choice has been made. You may attend to your work. I watched in horror as two of the Watchmen began walking toward the houses in front of them, and the third one walked away from a house. I was confused. I chose the lonely woman, but her Watchman was walking away, and he disappeared into the night and the feed cut off. The other two videos grew bigger and took up the screen. What's going on? Was all I could say. The two watchmen that it showed each effortlessly broke into the houses. I was biting my bottom lip so hard that it bled. The feeds walked along with them as they each silently roamed through the houses. One watchman walked into the set-up baby room and looked around gingerly, and then made his way across the hall to the other bedroom. The other watchman walked slowly down the hall, seemingly trying to decide which room to enter, and he chose the children's room. I looked over to the first one. He stood at the foot of the sleeping couple's bed, holding a machete. He walked to one side and began swinging wildly. There were screams so loud and frightened that I felt like I might pass out or throw up. I looked over to the other video reluctantly. The watchman stood in the children's room, right in the center of the pink bunk bed. He also brandished a machete. I screamed as he raised it up and reached over and pulled the computer plug out of the wall. I was terrified, traumatized. What had I just witnessed? What had I just done? My mouth felt dry, my head was spinning out of control, and my heart felt like it might burst from my chest. After several hours, I decided to check my computer and hope that the nightmare I had witnessed was gone, and there was nothing. Days later, I was checking my email when I stopped and recoiled in horror. There was an email from the Night Watchman. I finally opened it, and I really don't know why. Maybe I was hoping that it would tell me that I had been punked or something. Instead, it was a few large words in an otherwise white background. Jenna thanks you for excluding her from a Night Watchman fate. We thank you for your choices, too, and we truly enjoyed our encounter with you. Come play again any time. Attached was a picture of the lonely woman walking her dog in the park, still looking down at her phone. I will never, ever access the deep web again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or over email and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts, all links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, don't rot in your bed. Entertain instead.